But anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, the church here is a sweet church and victory and all the experience we had at victory and, and all the different things. Well, I tell you, I could be here for a month. Isn't that right, Kevin? Amen. Okay, good, good. All right. Next, when I leave next month, we'll go okay. All right. All right. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Luke. To the book of Luke. I'm excited about our message tonight. Excited not in a way that I'd be excited perhaps at Christmas or excited perhaps at my birthday. But I'm excited because some of the signs that I am seeing are signs that are obvious signs of the world yet to come, the kingdom. The tribulation generation, we've been preaching about it. Um, Sunday night, we talked about the, uh, the religious but not ready generation. There are people today in churches all over the world that are very highly religious, extremely religious, but not ready, not saved, not born again. We talked about the ten virgins. And then Monday night, we talked about the all-wet generation. We talked about the times of Noah and how the people were in the times of Noah. They were wicked. They were terrible people. They were people of, of complete pagan and heathenism. And folks, didn't that describe our world today? Hasn't that described our, our world as we have come to know it? Which one of us 20 years ago would have believed that we'd live in a country, in a society like today. I, I am absolutely flabbergasted as I watch the news. I'm absolutely overwhelmed if I read the newspaper. That's why I don't take the newspaper. My wife will tell you I don't take the newspaper because I can't read it all the time. It's just overwhelming to me. So we live in a world that's wicked. We know it's the last days. It's the all-wet generation. They're waiting for judgment, really. And then tonight we're going to go in the skeptical generation. We're going to see that in a moment. What the generation we live in today, this, this tribulation generation, we have a skeptical generation. And then tomorrow night we're going to talk about the faithless generation. The faithless generation. Let's look here in Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17 we're going to start with verse 26. Luke 17, and we'll start just as a way of introduction in verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. We talked about that last night, a wicked and depraved generation. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. The Bible says here, so in verse 30, or excuse me, in verse uh, uh, 28, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus is coming back, folks. He's going to come back to receive His bride. He's going to come back and get the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. He's going to come and He's going to remove us from this terrible place. He's going to save us from the wrath to come. That's a wonderful thing to look forward to. That's the only thing that holds my heart strong to know that we are in those last days. We're going to take a look at Lot. In fact, as we're staying here, you'll turn to, to Genesis chapter 13. And as you're turning, let me quote some scriptures for you. As in the days of Lot, folks, we're going to see the skeptical generation. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, knowing this first, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We live in a world today, a, a society today, a culture today, when people are extremely skeptical about the Lord Himself. 
If you go to knock on somebody's house and go and say, look, I'd like to invite you to church. The first thing you see in their eyes is that attitude of what do you want from me? We've come to bring Jesus to their home. We've come to share with them the love of Christ. And all they're thinking is, what do you want from me? Well, I blame the church in many, many ways. I blame those television preachers sometimes that get caught in immorality. I blame the priests who got caught into that terrible, terrible, sinful actions. <clears throat> we see all these things on TV. We see all these things on the on the uh, uh, newspapers and the books. And we wonder, what is this Christianity all about? Just a few months ago, a Southern Baptist preacher, a man who sat across from me month after month, week after week, <clears throat> sharing the bread of life with me, sharing the love of Christ with each other, talking about the things of the Lord. The FBI arrested him, took his computer. He had over a thousand movies, DVDs of child pornography. I wouldn't have believed it. Wouldn't have known it. Here was a quote-unquote man of God living for the things of the Lord. He was a chaplain of the sheriff's department. He knew what he was risking with his life. But as a, as a quote-unquote Christian, he got caught into things he shouldn't have gotten into. We're going to see that in the life of Lot tonight. We are living in the last days. The scoffers that the apostle is talking about Peter's not the increase of atheistic thought. Folks, listen, they took a poll and they found out that atheism has increased in our lifetime. It's gone from 1% to 2%. Not very many atheists, and yet they try to rule our, our society and our culture. We've become a secular nation because one woman decided that we shouldn't pray in school. One woman. She shook the foundation of the Supreme Court because she didn't want her son to pray in school. By the way, later on, he became an evangelist. Got saved, became an evangelist. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? And where is Madeline Murray O'Hare? Nobody knows. That woman's been missing for years. I think God just took her out and that was it, it was gone. Who knows? But anyway, these scoffers are not talking about more atheists. Peter is not talking about more, more, and more of, of the agnostics in life. But those who profess the name of Jesus in the last days are going to be caught up in the things of this world. They're going to be caught up in the affairs of man and the things of life. They're going to be too busy for God, too busy for the things of God. We're going to see that they're not reading their Bibles like they used to. They're not reading their Bibles like they ought to. We're going to see that they're not scoffing by their words necessarily, but they're scoffing by their deeds. They're not praying like they ought to pray. Mama's not praying for babies. They're too busy. They're working. They're making money to pay for things they don't need, things they really shouldn't have if it's going to be at the expense of their family. Children act like heathens because mamas aren't praying. I remember waking up early in the morning. My mother would be up earlier than me, of course, and she'd be sitting there at the table and her Bible was open. I have that Bible in my office today. I can open up and see the coffee stains on the Bible. And that, those, those are precious to me because I'd watch her drink that cup of coffee and I'd watch her read her Bible and I'd watch her pray and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt she was praying, telling the Lord on me. She'd leave little notes for me. John, read Proverbs such and such. I'd go to that to be talking about prostitutes, and I think, what am I? What is she trying to tell me here? You talk about getting away from wild and wicked women. I'm thinking, I'm a high school student. What are you doing to me? But my mother knew that those days would come. My mother knew, and she prayed for me. We have mothers today are too busy earning money rather than praying for children. We have too many fathers that are so far out of the way. They're not home anymore. Oh, they're not, they're not out of the picture, so to speak. They're just not at home. And when they're home, they tell their children, leave me alone. I don't have time for you. Christians not reading their Bibles, not praying, not tithing, not going to church, denying the soon coming of Jesus, not by their words, but by their actions. 
empty churches all over America today. You can go to churches all over America and you can find empty churches, pews wide open, need to be filled. Lost people need to be in these pews, folks. Every pew you look around you and at Calvary and all these places, we have empty places. And there are people in my church, we have empty pews. And I tell my people, where are these people? Do you think by putting a sign out front they're going to come? We scoff at the things of God, not by our action, by our words, but by our deeds. Lot was like that. He was a man who once believed in God, but he lived eventually like a heathen, like a skeptic, like a pagan. What a horrible story of Lot. But I'm going to share with you at the close of our message a startling scripture about Lot. Let's take a look here in Genesis chapter 13. I'm going to show you the three tragic steps of Lot. The three tragic steps of Lot. First of all, we're going to see in verses 8 through 13 in Genesis chapter 13, the focus of his skepticism. The Bible says in verse 8 in chapter 13, So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other, and Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Let's pray for a moment. Our Father God, we come to you again tonight. I thank you, Father, for your presence on the the other services we have been together. I thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit was our teacher and our guide. I thank you, Father, that you've told us where two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, your presence through your Holy Spirit would be here. And so tonight, Father, as we have gathered once more, in this time and in this place, we ask that each heart be open to receive the message that each heart would be open to receive as the psalmist declared, my cup runneth over. That every heart would be open to receive the word of the teacher, the great paraclete, the great comforter, the Holy Spirit. That their heart might be filled and their joy might be complete and their heart might be stirred to live more for you than ever before. Father, let us say as we leave this place, not only that it was good to be in the house of the Lord, but that we cannot wait to return once more. Be with us, Father. Let your word speak to our hearts. For it is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We see in verse 8 and 9 that Lot directed himself toward Sodom. That's the first problem, folks. That's the first problem of the child of God. That's the first problem of skepticism in the life of the believer when he begins to direct himself towards Sodom. In verse 8 and 9, we see there was a contention. The contention of Lot's family. There was a fight. You ever have a fight in your family? Oh, I can tell by your faces you never had one. Oh, I can just tell that there have never been a problem in the family. Uncle Abram had left Ur of Chaldee. He'd gone to the bank that day and said, Hey, I want to withdraw all my money. Where are you going, Lot? You going, oh, excuse me, Abram, are you going to go across town and build a new house? Nope. I'm going to where the Lord has directed me. Where's that? I don't know. I don't know where I'm going, but when I get there, I'll know I'll be there. And he began walking off. And you know what? His nephew Lot said, Uncle Abram, can I go with you? You, you seem to know God. You've said God spoke to you. I believe you, Uncle Abram, and I believe in your God, and I want to go with you. And Lot and his family went with, with Abram. And they traveled all over that fertile crescent all the way down into Canaan land. 
and suddenly they got into a fight, a problem. And Abram brought them together. The attentiveness of Abram brought them together in verse 8. And he gave a call to cease their feuding. In verse 8 he said, Please let there be no strife between you and me. Oh, folks, would to God we have more Abrams in the church today. Oh, would to God we'd have more Abrams in the community today that say, let's act like Christians. Let's be Christians today. Let's not get caught up in the affairs of this world. Let's not act like the pagans and act like the heathens. Let's not act like some skeptical person about the things of God. He had also a call to concede the family. In verse 8 he said, Let there be no strife between you and my husband, for we are brethren. We've got a problem in the family. You know, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, And let, and let, that word let means that you have the choice. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were also called in one body and be thankful. Beloved, I have found a long time ago a fussy, a sourpuss Christian who looks like he was born in the objective mood and weaned by a will, uh, excuse me, a dill pickle. <clears throat> I got thinking about that dill pickle I had today. It made my mouth pucker up there. Listen, folks, those people, are, they're, great, they're not grateful to the things that God has given them. The first sign you're going to see in an old skeptical Christian is that they're ungrateful for the things God has done for him. Oh, beloved, listen, just count your many blessings as the song goes. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. Count your many blessings, folks. If Abram and Lot would have just sat down and said, look what God has done for us, Nothing would have happened, I think. Look at verse 9, the accommodation of Abram. We see his petition for peace in verse 9. He says, please separate from me. If you'll take the left, I'll go to the right. Abram was the great patriarch. He could have told him, look, son, I'm going to give you whatever you want. I'm going to give you what I want you to have. But he chose, let's have a petition for peace. I want it right. And look at his plan for peace. You take the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. What if Brother Lot, what if Nephew Lot would have said, Oh, Uncle Abram, this is terrible. Let's have no fight between our families. I don't want to go anywhere. What can we do to make this right? What can we do to make our family right? Oh, folks, the world laughs at us. The world scorns at us. By the way we act, we are scoffing at the things of God and they join us in the chorus. We knew all along this stuff was not real. We knew all along these things were not true. By our actions, beloved, we scoff at the beautiful things of God. Oh, what a sad, pathetic announcement of the church. By the way, in verse 9, when you direct your heart towards Sodom, you'll produce enmity in your heart for the things of God. When you begin looking towards Sodom, when you begin lusting after the things of Sodom, when you begin feeling good things about the things of Sodom, folks, the Bible says your heart begins cold or gets colder against God. Look at verse 10 through 13. We see the concession of Lot's flesh. In verse 10 and 11, we see Lot's ambitious consideration. Look at Lot's carnal vision in verse 10. He says, and Lot lifted his eyes. Now look at that. Now that means perhaps he was looking down at the ground. Perhaps he thought, oh, all along I know where old Sodom is. Abram doesn't realize, Uncle Abram doesn't realize he's given me the best deal here. And he lifted his eyes, the Bible says in verse 10, and saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. We see in verse 10, Lot's carnal vision. Folks, be careful what you look at. Be careful what you keep your eyes on. You know, I've always told my children, it's not what you, what you look at, it's what it's all about. It's what's truthful about it. These people who chat online, be very careful, folks. You may not be talking to a friend. I tell you, these teenagers get in trouble when they get in these chat lines thinking they're talking to another teenager and it's some crazy person. 
whose all intent is to do is to hurt someone. Be careful what you look at. Be careful what you desire. The Jewish sages taught that when Lot separated himself from Abraham, he separated himself from God. Do you notice that in verse 11? The Bible says here in verse 11, and they separated from each other. Do you know that their families never got back together again? That from this point on, Lot, who went after the things of God, following his uncle Abram, saying, I want to know this God that uncle Abram knows, went with his family into Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know the story about how it was destroyed. But beloved, what we find out afterwards is Lot and his daughters created the nation of Moab. God called Moab, by the way, his wash pot. Can I, can I translate that in our vernacular? It was his garbage dump. What a, what a wonderful family tradition, huh? This was the life of Lot. Lot made this fateful decision to abandon God, to abandon Abraham, to abandon all these things for the lights of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe he thought to himself, that this won't hurt just for a little while. We'll go down there, we'll make our fortune, and we'll get better. We'll go down there, we'll, we'll get some things together, we'll make a little money, get our nest egg secured, and we'll retire back with, uh, with Uncle Abram. But it never happened. Folks, when Christians choose to abandon the family of God, when Christians choose to abandon the church, they choose to abandon God. You cannot separate the bride of Christ from the groom. You cannot separate the bride of Christ from the groom. Jesus said, when you have done it to the least, these the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. We see his ambitious consideration. Look at verse 12 and 13. Lot's actual choice. In verse 12, we see Lot's secular neighborhood. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Directed himself towards Sodom. I'm heading that direction. He didn't think about that at first. Uh, we'll just kind of cozy up to it. We'll just kind of get close. How close can you get to a snake before it bites you? I mean, what kind of a moron would do that? We've seen them all the time on TV. The guy goes up there and says, look at this snake. It's indigenous to this area, and blah, blah, this and that. And all of a sudden it bites him. I mean, well, duh. You get close enough to a snake, what's it going to do? It's going to act like a snake. It's going to bite you. Folks, when you get close enough to Sodom, it's going to bite you. Duh. Amen. Do you think Sodom is going to behave like the Christian church? Do you think Sodom's going to change for you? That's what Lot thought, perhaps. He had a secular neighborhood. Oh, the houses were bigger in Sodom and Gomorrah. The neighborhoods were nicer. Oh, we had our gated community there at Sodom and Gomorrah. We see Lot's secular neighborhood. He left the tents. We see his sinful neighbors in verse 13. The Bible says, And God looked down upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses included in verse, in verse 13, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Folks, if I could show you you what God sees about this city and my city and the cities of America today and the cities of the world. Again, like I said last night, you and I would crawl under our bed and we wouldn't come out for two weeks. This world in which we live in is wicked and sinful. Oh, folks, don't cozy up to this world. Don't think in just a moment's time that I can get away with it for just a little while. Don't become skeptical like this world, and by your actions, be skeptical against the things of God. Lot was making the wrong choice. We see the fellowship of his skepticism. Not only did he direct himself towards Sodom, but he dwelt in Sodom. Oh, I, I don't know how it changed from that way. The Bible doesn't talk. Perhaps it was Mrs. Lot. Perhaps Mrs. Lot said, you know, the girls and I were talking, down at the, at the clubhouse in Sodom, how nice it would be if we would live in Sodom, rather out in one of our old tents out here in the, in the boonies. And so Lot, excuse me, Lot went to Sodom 
and, and got the big house, so to speak. In verse 11, we see his affiliation with the world. Now, what happened here in this portion of Scripture, the men of the plains came down and they attacked Sodom and Gomorrah. This is how we know that Lot dwelt in Sodom. Because they came down there, they attacked these cities, they took people captive, one of which was Lot. They took their goods and all their things. And eventually Abraham came and rescued Lot. Came and rescued Lot. We see here in verse 11 his affiliation with the world. In chapter 14, excuse me. Chapter 14, verse 11. And then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are these raiders who came in. And all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot. Folks, the world will take you. Lock, stock, and barrel. You cannot flirt with the world. It'll bite you. You cannot play with the world. It'll cheat you. Look at verse 12. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. We see his affiliation with the world, terrorized by the world. The world, by the way, beloved, will extort, extort your abundance. You say, well, I can, I can make a lot of money and then I'll retire and become a Christian. I'll serve in Sunday school. I'll live for God. I'll tithe then. I'll come to church every Sunday. Just let me get my, my thing done here. Let me make what I need to make and then I'll, be, I'll become what I need to be. That was Lot's thought, perhaps. But the world will come, folks, and it'll extort your abundance. It'll take your abundance from you. It'll extract your, ex, your assets. It'll take everything you have because the world wants it all. The world doesn't want just a little bit of you. It wants all of you. You cannot give the world a little bit of yourself. It will never be satisfied. It will take that which you have and it will give you nothing in return. In fact, they'll make fun of you. Think of the prodigal son. Left his father's house. Had all his riches given to him. His, his inheritance given to him early. He went all the way down and, and lived in the Bible calls in the King James Version. Riotous living. Had a good time. Saw him on MTV at all the different functions and things. That boy was on everywhere. He was jumping and jiving with everybody. Next thing you know, ran out of money. Hey, brother, when are we going to go to the next uh, big party here? And you are who? We already have your money, boy. We don't need you. We don't need you at all. And so that poor Jewish boy went down to find a job. Nobody would hire him. Nobody needed him. Nobody wanted him. So he got a job tending pigs. That's a nice job for a Jewish boy, isn't it? Until he woke up one day and said, I need to go home. Even my servant, father's servants live better than this. Folks, listen. You can't go down in the world and expect to thrive and survive. You've got to give up something to go there. Jesus won't go there with you. He'll say, son, I'll wait here on the path for you. You go on down and come on back. I'm here waiting for you. We see here he was terrorized by the world. You leave this world with nothing, folks. Nothing in this world you're going to take with you. Nothing, nothing you have bought and slaved hard, worked hard, put up with the worst bosses you could possibly put up with, worked the strangest hours you possibly could work, you gave your blood, sweat, and tears. And what's it for? One day you're going to die and leave it all behind for your kids to play around with, sell, or get rid of. I think about all the people whose stuff had been put at the edge of the road after the funeral for the, the junk man to come by and pick up. Tyrannized, terrorized by the world. They're also tyrannized by the world. It's a demand for your, devo de your devotion. It will capture you in slavery. It will demand that you give it all. We see it's the domination of your dreams. Soon you forget about heaven. All you think about is working. You see, when Lot saw the well water plains of the Jordan Valley, the Bible says it looked like heaven. Oh, it was like the Garden of Eden in the day when God was there. It looked like heaven, but it felt like hell. And that's what Lot's life was. 
he left the abundance of God to receive the, the, not the treasures of the world, but receive the horror, horror of the world. We see his fellowship of his skepticism. He dwelt in Sodom. Look at verse 12. His affil- afflictions from the world. Lot was susceptible to the world. You see, when he was away from Uncle Abram, away from the people of God, away from the family of God, away from the things of God, he was susceptible for the world to capture him. Look at verse 12. And they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods departed. Lot had stepped out of God's protective zone, beloved. You know, I pray for my children every day. I have since they've been born. I pray for them every day. Lord, put a hedge of protection around them. You know what, beloved? I think you ought to do that. I think you ought to pray for your children every day. I pray for my nephews and my nieces. I pray for my son-in-law and my daughter-in-law. I pray for family members. I pray for friends. I pray for church members. I pray for people. God, protect them from the evil one. But you know what? I can't stop you. And I can't stop my friends. And I can't stop my children who choose to step outside of that comfort zone, that that protective zone that God has placed about them. God wants to protect you, beloved, but you have the free will to choose to walk away from that protectiveness of Uncle Abram. You have the choice to walk away from the things of God and say, I'll just take a few steps out. Oh, beloved, it's tragic. I have seen as a pastor over and over and over and over again. We see Lot was susceptible to the world. He was unguarded by God's word. He was unprotected by God's will. Folks, you cannot, and I shared with you last night, you cannot expect the blessings of God's perfect will when you're living in his permissive will and not his perfect will. Why is God doing this to me? If I had a nickel every time I heard that, I'd be a rich man. I'd be smoking cigars and driving that Cadillac convertible you were looking at the other day. (laughs) Listen, folks, why do we blame it on God when it is you and I who choose to step outside of the protection of God? Not because God is, is inept or God cannot protect us. It's that we choose to step outside of it. Oh, folks, God gives us that choice. That's God's will to allow us free will to do what we choose to do. Oh, folks, we've got to be careful as Christians not to join the skeptics of this world. And by our life and by our actions, live lives of skepticism. Like the Bible says in the last days, scoffers. He says, first of all, scoffers will come. Oh, do we not laugh at the Bible when we don't read it? Do we not joke at the things of God when we, when we don't stand up for Jesus at work? Do we not laugh and, and, and make fun of the people of God if we choose not to go to the house of God when the doors are open? I know I'm preaching to the choir, brothers. I know, sisters, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here tonight. It's Tuesday night. My goodness, what a, what a wonderful group of people. Amen. But beloved, listen, if I don't preach to you and they don't come... I can't preach to them. I can at least preach to you to say, look, be careful. Don't take that step. Be careful. Any one of us can do that. Lot solidified in the world. His citizenship was in Sodom. Oh, by the way, once you get into the world, you invest way too much to get out. Suddenly it's a thing about, well, my kids are gone. My family's gone. I've lost everything, but I've invested way too much to get out. The price is always too high to live in Sodom. The price is always too great to live in Sodom. We see his commodities in Sodom. (laughs) They took everything he had. He had profited way too much in Sodom, and the world took it all away. You don't think those little coins we jingle in our pocket can't be taken from us? You ask the Jewish people who lived in Germany in the 1930s how one madman came into the world and changed the whole world by changing the laws 
and taking everything from those people. I've been to places where the Jewish people had gone and they took everything from them. I've been in the Holocaust museums and seen uh, shoes had been taken from them and rings had been taken from them. Their hair had been shaven and put in mattresses. Their own bodies had been burned down and taken to fat and used for soap. Some of these people were hor horribly abused and murdered and beaten. Oh, you don't think the world can't take it from you? We see the fellowship of the skeptic, the fellowship of his skepticism. He dwelt in Sodom. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. We'll see the failure of his skepticism. The price is always too high to live in Sodom, folks. We see the failure of his skepticism in, in Genesis chapter 19. Look at verse 12. The Bible says in verse 12 through 15, he failed his family. Then the men said to Lot, this is the, these are the angels. Remember the angels had come to Abram. And they said, we're going to, kill, we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. One of those angels was a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus, a Theophanes or a Christophanes. One of them was the Lord. And the other two were angels. And they came and talked to Abram. And Abram said, oh God. And he began to bargain with the Lord. If, if, if God. And he started naming these numbers. If there's so many righteous men here, would you spare the city? Finally, he got down to the point where he was thinking of Lot's family. He said, oh God, if there are just ten righteous men in Sodom, would you spare it? Would you spare it? God said, yes, I would, if there were ten. And we see he failed his family because these men, these angels in verse 12, came to destroy the city. And the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Lot was there with his wife and his two daughters. Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-laws he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. We see in verse 12 and 13 this call of evacuation. It was a time of spiritual census. Do you have a family? Lot, I see you have these two daughters here that are virgins. He said, I have two daughters. Remember, they, the men of Sodom came to engage these two men who came to the city, these two strangers. They wanted to engage with them in a relationship that, according to the Bible, was wrong, sinful, perverted. Lot said, please don't. I have two daughters here. They have known no man. Let me, let me bring them out. Do not do this terrible thing to these two men. So he had two daughters living at home. What a terrible thing, by the way, to say about your children, to do for your children. Lot had got to the point where he would have sacrificed his own daughters to protect his reputation of these two men staying in his home, these two angels. Do you have any children, they asked him. You've got these two daughters and your wife? Do you have any sons-in-laws? Of course he had sons-in-laws. We don't know how many. We take that number that Ed Abram said, that number of ten, perhaps there was... Uh, three more sons-in-laws with three more daughters that were married. We don't know that. That's, that's pure speculation. But if Lot was, or excuse me, if Abram was thinking about Lot's family, about ten people, we have at least uh, three more couples that could have come but stayed in Sodom. A time for spiritual senses, a time for staggering crisis. Look at verse 13. The Bible says they're going to destroy the city. The angels came to warn Lot. By the way, do you know why the angels went to warn Lot? Because Uncle Abram had been praying for him. We see they came to warn. You know what the word angel means? It means messenger. You got messengers today warning you of the time to come. 
You got messengers today warning you that Jesus is coming soon. You got angels, if you want to call them. I don't know if you would call pastor an angel. I don't know about that. I know some pastors, they're pretty grumpy, they're pretty mean. If you want to know what truthfully what you want to name the pastor, just ask the wife, they'll tell you. The truth of the matter is we have messengers warning us all along. Oh, folks, don't go towards Sodom. Is everyone ready to go in your family? If Jesus was getting ready to blow the trumpet and he came into your home today and said, I'm going to destroy the world, get your family together and let's go. And you go out to your sons-in-laws and you go out to your sons and your daughters' houses and say, come, let's go. Jesus is going to destroy the city. Would they laugh at you? My daddy, you've been busy in Sodom. You're just like the rest of them. In fact, some people believe that he was the mayor of Sodom. He gotten so involved. No time to get ready on that day. The time is now. Now is the time to be ready. Now is the time to be ready. We see the call of evacuation in verse 14 and 15. We see the cry of earnestness. The pitiful rejection in verse 14. But his sons-in-laws, it seemed to him, to them, that he was joking. What a pathetic reality in verse 15. And when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Nobody else came. Nobody else came. Lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Oh, folks. Daddy, who will you be leaving behind at the rapture? Daddy, when God comes to destroy the world once more in tribulation, who's going to be left behind? Mama, is that job worth it? Is that new car worth it? Daddy, is that new new little trinket you have, is that worth it? that you were willing to trade your sons and your daughters and your children and those under your protection, is it worth it? Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. I told you I was going to share some unusual scripture with you, startling scripture with you about Lot. Here is Lot. If you walked in Sodom that day before the angels came, you could not tell the difference between Lot and the rest of the crowd of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says he dwelt in the the gate, which meant in most of the Middle Eastern commentaries that he was probably the lawgiver there. He was the mayor. His wife had become high up in the circles of the social centers. His children were known all over the place. He'd become just the opposite of what his uncle Abram had been. So truthfully, he must have not been saved. Truthfully, he must have lost his salvation. What happened? Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7 and 8. The Bible says in verse 7, And delivered, underline these two words, righteous lot. Beloved, this was a, today a Christian. This was a Christian. This was a man who lived in skepticism, but was delivered because of God's word. And delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. We see in verse 7 a divine rescue of Lot, the the removal of Lot. God removed him from the, the tribulation. God removed him from the horrors. But Lot lost his children. Lot lost his wife who when she came out, she turned. She got thinking, what's going to happen to the country club? What's going to happen to my social circle? What's going to happen to all these different places? And when she turned, God turned her into a pillar of salt. Why is that, Pastor? 
Why is that preacher? Why did that woman turn to salt? Well, you have to understand this one thing, folks. You see, Lot tried to get her out of Sodom, but he couldn't take Sodom out of the wife. She was not saved. No one says about the righteous wife of Lot. We see the the ruination of Lot. It's a picture of the carnal Christian who is raptured but isn't prepared to meet Jesus. The Bible says not to be ashamed at his appearing. Beloved, there are going to be Christians in that day that when the trumpet sounds, they're going to say, Oh, but I've got to do this. Oh, let me go and talk to my sons-in-laws. Let me go talk to my daughters. Let me tell them Jesus is coming. They wouldn't listen to you. And that twinkling eye will be changed and will be taken with Christ. A picture of the carnal Christian who's raptured but isn't prepared to meet Jesus. Are you prepared to meet Jesus? Daddy, are you prepared to meet Jesus? Will Jesus ask you where your children are? Mama, will Jesus ask you where are your children? Uncle, will they ask you where's your nephews and nieces? Aunt, will they ask you where your nephews and nieces are? Where's your daddy and your mommy? What will Jesus say when he first meets you? You know, we think everything's going to be a big hoot nanny up in heaven. You know, there are two times that the Bible says that Jesus will wipe away their tears. You know, both times it's in heaven. Both times once it's at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat judgment, when you and I are going to stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. And the other time is when we see the conclusion of the great white throne judgment when God judges. When God judges the sinful men and women of this world. Why is that, preacher? Because we're going to see mamas and daddies, brothers and sisters, children, nephews, nieces, bosses, next door neighbors, people who we love, who Jesus will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Oh, beloved, I don't want to hear that with me, do you? Do you want to hear that being said to your child? Would you want to hear that say to you, said to your mother or your, or your friend or your boss? We see the divine rescue of Lot. But look at verse 8, the devastating remorsefulness of Lot. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day to seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. His anguish by their companionship. Folks, when you are living in the world, you're going to become skeptical just by the mere companionship of these people. You're not going to grow closer to Jesus living with the world. You're not going to grow closer to Jesus by living like the world. He was in anguish, the Bible says. And by his his affliction, by their conduct, the Bible says he was tormented. Tormented. Oh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> Let's close with these two verses. Turn a little bit to the left, not far. To the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Folks, in the last days, the scoffers are going to come. In the last days, I told you the other day, we talked about the progressiveness of the apostasy. It starts with the denial of the Bible, the falling away from the Bible. And then it goes to the falling away from the church. We're seeing people today, Christians included, not going to church anymore. And eventually we're going to see a complete falling away from Jesus. That's when the rapture happens and the church that's left behind will become totally apostate. They'll give up Jesus in a heartbeat. Look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 and 13. The Bible says in verse 12, Beware, brethren, speaking to Christians, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you, any of you, 
underline that. Put that word me next to it. Any of you, me, preacher, lest I become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Folks, your heart can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I've seen it in the lives of Christians all my ministry. I've seen Christians fall away from the things of God and become skeptical to the things of God. And their heart becomes hardened to the things of God. Oh, beloved, don't become like that. Oh, you don't want to be like that. Don't be like Lot and be tormented day and night with the wickedness around you. Stay away from those places. Don't frequent the places you need that they go to. Don't go to the places they live. Don't associate with their evilness and their wickedness. Well, I won't do it, preacher. I'll just go and listen to it. Listen, folks. <clears throat> You'll be tormented by their wickedness. Skepticism is going to rise in the last days. Scoffing is going to rise in the last days. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear it about people who no longer go to church anymore, or no longer read their Bible. You see that emptiness in their eyes, the hollowness in their heart. They're not winning anybody to Christ anymore. Ask, the, ask yourself this question. When was the last time I led somebody to Jesus? Ask yourself this question. When's the last time somebody walked down that aisle to receive Christ? Because I invited them and I brought them and I paid the price because I love Jesus and wanted them to come. Folks, ask yourself this question. When was the last time I really got in the word of God and appreciated it? Oh, beloved, listen to it. Listen to the life of Lot and run, run from the plains of Sodom. Run back to Uncle Abram. Go back to the church. Go back to reading your Bible. Go back to the things of God. Go back to the family of God. Beloved, you have a choice. One road leads to living for Jesus. The other road leads to skepticism. One road leads to joy and rejoicing one day when Jesus comes. The other road leads to frustration and sadness standing before Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. But more especially in a night like this, in a time like this, in a crowd like this, Father, we thank you that your presence here speaks to hearts of men and women tonight. Oh, Father God, we are here and we have gathered to hear your word. Speak now, tonight, to the hearts of men and women. Oh, Father God, there might be someone here today that needs to be saved. They might be a member of a church here in this area. They might even be a member of this church, but some reason, somehow, you spoke to that heart saying, you need Jesus. Oh, Father God, bring them forward. Let them come down and take the pastor by the hand and say, I want this, Jesus. I don't want to play around anymore. I want the real thing. And Father God, there might be beloved ones here, Christians born again, who have been flirting with the things, the things of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're drawing closer to the wrong fires and warming their hands around the wrong places, fellowshipping with the wrong people. Oh, Father God, move their hearts. There are those here tonight, Father, that are prayer warriors. That they're the only ones praying for that child. They're the only ones praying for that mommy and daddy. Let them come tonight, Father, and pray at this altar that you would bring strength to that child or that family member or that friend. That they may turn from the lights of Sodom. Oh, Father God, if we do not pray as people of God, if we will not we if we'll not give our heart to the things of our family and friends, who else will? Oh, Father God, move us. Move us. Do not let us fall in the lethargy of skepticism. Do not let us fall into the, the anguish of the reprobateness of this world. Oh, Father God, move us. Grant us, Father, your presence this one more time that we might be serious about the things of God. For it is in Jesus' name we pray.
Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.